Hey everyone. Welcome back to my channel. Don't forget to click like and subscribe if you want more daily updates on audiobook. The White Boy Shuffle by Paul Beatty. 2. My earliest memories body surf the warm comforting timelessness of the Santa Ana winds, whipping me in and around the palm tree lined streets of Santa Monica. Me and white boys Stephen Pierce, Ryan Fogarty, and David Schoenfeld sharing secrets and bubble gum. Our friendship was a buoyant one based on proximity, easy to remember phone numbers, and the fact that Ryan always had enough money for everybody. We were friends, but didn't see ourselves as a unit. We had no enemies, no long standing rivalries with the feared Hermosa Beach Sandcastle Hellions or the exclusive Brentwood spoiled brat millionaire tycoon killers. Our conflicts limited themselves to fighting with our sisters and running from the Santa Monica Shore Patrol. My co-conspirators in beach terrorism and I suffered through countless admonishments from overzealous officers lucky enough to grab one of us in some act of mischief that was always a precursor to a lifetime of incarceration bunking with society's undesirables. Young man, try to imagine a future behind bars. What you in for, young buck? I garnished the potato salad of this obese family of Orange County sea cows with sand crabs. Premeditated? Hell, yeah. The entire clan beached themselves fully clothed 20 feet from the water. Tourists. Fucked up the local vibe. Hey, that's worth a couple of years, easy. Chows at 6 o'clock. After I was escorted home by the police, one too many times, my mother made me join Cub Scout Pack No. 251, starting me on the socialization treadmill toward group initiation and ceremonial induction. I was kicked out after three meetings for failing to learn the pledge, but the experience stayed with me. It was as if somebody assigned a den mother to point out the significance of campy blue uniforms with buttons in every imaginable place, flags, and oaths. My salt air world began to subdivide into a series of increasingly complicated dichotomous relationships. Thankfully, I still remember when my worldview wasn't us against them or me versus the world, but me and the world. I was an ashy legged black beach bum sporting a lopsided trapezoidal natural and living in a hilltop two story townhouse on 6th and Bay. After an exhausting morning of bodyboarding and watching seagulls hovering over the ocean expertly catching French fries, I would spend the afternoon lounging on the rosewood balcony. Sitting in a lawn chair, my spindly legs crossed at the ankles, I'd leaf through the newest Time Life mail order installments of the family's coffee table reference library. Predators of the Incefti world, air war over Europe, gunfighters of the Old West, I loved reading about red ant, black ant wars, dogfights at 15,000 feet, and any cowboy who was so mean he once shot a man for snoring. The baseball game would crackle and spit from the cheap white transistor radio my father gave me for my seventh birthday. The tiny tweeter damp with drool from Dodger play-by-play -play man Chip Parker salivating over Rusty Lanahan's agility around the bag and how despite allegations of spousal abuse the first baseman with the all-American punim remained a shining role model for the city's youth. If I still swore on my mother, I'd swear that between pitches I could hear the fizzing of the sun setting behind me, cooling down with a well-earned bedtime dip in the Pacific. I like to twist the glossy time-life photos in the fading yellow light. When the praying mantis's chalky lime green changed to ghostly white and AB-26 Marauder Bomber's drab army olive melted away into a muddy dark brown, it was time for dinner. The call of the irate mother could be heard over the roar of the airplanes flying off the page. Gooner, set the fucking table. K. Ma. Before making my way to the silverware drawer, I'd lean over the balcony, squinting into the dusk, and look out toward the nearly empty waterfront six blocks away. The elongated shadows of beachcombers and their metal detectors skimmed across the dimpled and paper cup laden sand in hopes of finding lost sandwich baggies full of quarters stolen long ago from the bottom of parents' dresser drawers. Lifeguard Station 26 is boarded up and shut down for the evening. The sandy-colored hairy-legged lifeguard walks quickly toward his classic convertible VW Beetle, his cherry-red vinyl shorts and windbreaker barking, caution. 
dangerous riptide, and fluttering in the strong sea breeze. Two shimmering wetsuit-clad surfers straddle fiberglass day glow boards bobbing offshore, waiting for the last good wave of the day to take them home. The sandpipers play tag with the receding tide, scampering just outside the stretching reach of the waves dying at their knobby feet. Every once in a while the birds call time out to take water breaks, sticking their thin beaks into the moist sand. The sun stops fizzing, though Chip Parker remains excited, haranguing the listening audience about leftfielder Nathaniel Galloway's powerful negroid hindquarters and segueing smoothly into the ad copy for Farmer John's Ham, Hickory Smoked Just the Way You Like It. The lights at Dodger Stadium and the street lamps flicker on, and throughout Santa Monica the obedient kids wave goodnight to their delinquent friends as the community goes into the seventh-inning stretch. Jesse Stewart retires the side in order, one, two, three. And after six it's the Dodgers three, the Mets one. Life was full of cracker jacks, root, root rooting for the home team, and fucking with my mother. Gooner. Set the table. Ma. You know what? What? That's what. Very funny. Set the table or I'll wash your sharp-tongued mouth out with the whetstone. I was very funny, in a sophomoric autodidactic knock-knock who's, their sort of way. I learned timing, zen and the art of self-deprecation from the glut of Jewish stand-up comics on cable TV, who served as living Chinese acupuncture charts of comedic pressure points, dating, in, parents in, daily absurdities young. The ancient texts of Bennett's surf and the humorous anecdotes from Grandma's waterlogged readers' digests were, if not the I Ching, at least Confucian hymnals. I was the funny, cool black guy. In Santa Monica, like most predominantly white sanctuaries from urban blight, cool black guy is a versatile identifier used to distinguish the harmless black male from the Caucasian juvenile while maintaining politically correct semiotics. If someone was planning a birthday party, the potential invitees always asked, who's going to be there? The conversation would go, Sean, Lance, Gooner. Gooner? Who's that? You know, the funny, cool black guy. Some kids had reps for shredding on skateboards or eating ear wax. My forte was the ability to hold a straight face and pull off the nervy prank. I learned early that white kids will believe anything anybody a shade darker than chocolate milk says. So I'd tell the gullible patties that I was part gypsy and had the innate ability to tell fortunes. Waving my left index finger like a pendulum over their sticky palms, I'd forecast long lifetimes of health and prosperity. You'll have a big house in the hills. Over here on the love line is your tennis court. Right here by the life line is your heliport. Now where do you want your pool? The unsuspecting dupe would point to a spot usually midway between the mystic cross and the creative line, and I'd spit a wad of saliva somewhere near the designated area. There's your pool. I was the only cool black guy at Mestizo Mulatto Mongrel Elementary, Santa Monica's all-white multicultural school. My early education consisted of two types of multiculturalism, classroom multiculturalism, which reduced race, sexual orientation, and gender to inconsequence, and schoolyard multiculturalism, where the kids who knew the most Polak, queer, and farmer's daughter jokes ruled. The classroom cross, cultural teachings couldn't compete with the playground blacktop lessons, which were cruel but at least humorous. Like most aspects of regimented pop quiz pedagogy, the classroom multiculturalism was contradictory, though its intentions were good. My third grade teacher, Ms. Sejani, liked to wear a shirt that read, black, white, red, yellow, brown. Human. Whenever she wore it she seemed to pay special attention to me, Salvador Aguacaliente, the silent Latin kid who got to go home early on Cinco de Mayo, and Sheila Watanabe, the loudest pledge of allegiance sayer in the history of American education, taking care to point out the multiculturalist propaganda posted above the blackboard next to the printed and cursive letters of the alphabet, Ericism. The sun doesn't care what color you are. 
On hot stage 3 smog alert California days Ms. Sejani would announce, okay, class, put away your pencils and take out your science books. Turn to page 88. Melissa, please read starting from Fun with Sunshine and Thermodynamics. Melissa Scoopman would begin in her deliberate relentless monotone. This may sound funny, to the novice, third-grade scientist, but sunshine is cool. Without it, the earth, would be, as lifeless as a Catholic funeral on a, rainy, dreary day. I'd try to fall asleep, but it was too hot even to daydream. My sweat-soaked suicidal tendencies you can't bring me down tour shirt clung to the inversion layer of grit on my skin. Melissa droned on. Dark colors, such as, black absorb sunlight, and light colors, such as, white reflect sunlight. I looked up and down my skinny dark brown arms and turned to my lab partner, Cecilia Pietmeyer, the palest kid in school. Cecilia's skin was so transparent that one week during health Ms. Sejani used Cecilia's see-through skim milk white limbs to show the difference between arteries, capillaries, and veins. Cecilia, are you hot? I asked. No. Shit. Gunnar, what was the last thing Melissa read? Uh, she said um. She said dark colors soak up the sun's rays through processes called conduction and convection and the lighter colors of the spectrum tend to alter the path of the radiation through reflection and refraction. Good, I thought you weren't paying attention. Melissa, please continue. Everything was multicultural, but nothing was multicultural. The class studied Asian styles of calculation by learning to add and subtract on an abacus and we then applied the same mathematical principles on Seiko calculators. Prompting my hand to go up and me to ask naively, isn't the Seiko XL-126 from the same culture as the abacus? Ms. Sejani's response was, no, we gave this technology to the Japanese after World War II. Modern technology is a Western construct. Oh. To put me in my place further, Sheila Watanabe hummed, My country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty loud enough for the whole class to hear. One year during Wellness Week a MASH unit of city health workers set up camp in the gymnasium to ensure that America would have an able-bodied supply of future mid-level managers ready to lead the reinforcement brigades of minimum-wage foot soldiers to their capitalistic battle stations. A free enterprise penologist was a physically fit one. We answered the patriotic call one girl and boy at a time. Alison Abramovitz and Aaron Aronson were the first to go. Brave warriors, they left with no send-off party save the frightened faces of their classmates. Ten minutes later Alison returned unharmed. She skipped over to her desk, sat down, and covered a sly I know something you don't smile with her hand. Kent Munson quickly asked for permission to sharpen his pencil. He dropped the pencil next to Allison and asked her what happened. She hissed, none of your beeswax, sending Kent slinking back to his seat defeated. When copycat and cootie-infested Katie Swickler tried the same technique, Allison greeted her with a message whispered in her ear. Then girls throughout the classroom giggled and smiled at Katie, thanking her for the reassurance. It was as if they were communicating through gender-specific telepathy, leaving us guys looking more confused than usual. Then Aaron Aronson walked in, his face drained of color, his arms stuck tightly to his sides, and a newly acquired tick violently tossing his head back at a sickeningly acute angle every two seconds. Zombified, he walked a few steps into the classroom, stopped, and shouted, oh shit, you guys. They touched my balls and made me cough. Ms. Sejani ignored Aaron's pederastic pronouncements, called two more names, and continued her lecture on the importance of living in a colorblind society. Does anyone have an example of colorblind processes in American society? Ed Wisimer raised his hand and said, justice. Good.
Anything else? Millicent Offerman, who as teacher's pet spoke without raising her hand, shouted out, the president sure seems to like people of color. Anyone else think of anything that's colorblind? Gunner? Dogs. I believe that dogs are truly colorblind, but they're born that way. Class, it's important that we judge people for what? Their minds. And not their what? Color. The response to Ms. Sejani's call was mostly soprano. I know none of the boy altos were into it, too busy cursing ourselves for wearing the same drawers two days in a row. Colorblind? I hoped the doctor would be totally blind, or he might pull down my underwear, see the brown skid marks on my white Montgomery Ward cotton briefs, and recommend me for placement in special education. Eventually Ms. Sejani called my name and I left to be examined by a quiet nurse and a doctor so old he may have co-written the Hippocratic Oath. I was weighed and measured. The doctor banged on my knees with a rubber tomahawk, then asked me to pull down my drawers. Ignoring my stains, he wrapped his trembling and wrinkled hand around my equally wrinkled scrotum. I didn't flinch. Which surprised him. Anyone ever do this to you before, son? No. Do you know what I am doing, son? Touching my balls. Do you know why? Cough. Ahem. To practice your juggling? Oh, you're one of those funny cool black guys, aren't you? No, I'm testing you for a hernia. Cough. Ahem. How do you test the girls? I pinch their nipples and ask them to whistle. Pull up your pants and we'll test your sight. I sat on a stool and read the eye chart with no problems. The nurse placed an open book on my lap and asked if I saw any numbers in the pattern of colored dots. I pointed out the yellow-orange 86 in the sea of gray dots and asked the nurse what I was being tested for. The doctor stopped shaking long enough to interrupt the nurse and answer, colorblindness. Our teacher says we're supposed to be colorblind. That's hard to do if you can see color, isn't it? Yeah, I'd say so, but I think your teacher means don't make any assumptions based on color. Cross on the green and not in between. They're talking about human color. So? So just pretend that you don't see color. Don't say things like, black people are lecherous, violent, natural-born criminals. But I'm black. Oh, I hadn't noticed. I went back to class and told the still nervous boys in the back rows whose last names began with the letters L through Z that the physical wasn't too bad other than when the doctor measures your dick with a ruler and calls out to the nurse, penis size normal, or teeny weeny, or fucking humongous. And Karowski, who was twice as blind as Helen Keller but determined to go through life without wearing glasses, asked me if I remembered the letters on the bottom of the eye chart. I told her F-E-C-E-S and opened my primer to the story about a war between a herd of black elephants and a herd of white elephants. I don't remember what the elephants were fighting about, something about hating each other for the colors of their sponge-rubbery skins. It wasn't as if the black elephants had to use the mosquito-infested watering hole and rely on white elephant welfare for their quinine. After heavy casualties on both sides, a sea stusking was called. The elephants, as wounded and bedraggled as elephants could possibly be, headed off into the hills, only to return to the plains years later as a harmonious and homogeneous herd of grey elephants. I never could figure out why that story was so disquieting. Maybe it was the unsettling way Eileen Litmus would loudly slam shut her reader and stare at me from across the room as we completed the assignment at the end of the story. 1. Why did the elephants not get along? A folded note would soon find my hand under the desk. 2. How foam the elephants fame BAFK Gray? I'd open the note, trying my best not to rustle the paper. The scrawl read, Fuck the stupid elephants. I like the tortoise and the hare story much more better. I challenge you to a race. 
Meet me after school for a race from the baseball diamond to the handball courts and back. Do you accept the challenge or are you a pigeon-toed wuss? P.S. You have big ears so you must be an African elephant. 3. Can we apply this story to real life? I'd look up and see Eileen's hand raised high in the air, her eyes radar locked on mine. Ms. Sejani. Ms. Sejani. Gunner's passing notes. Ms. Sejani would squeak her pudgy sandal-shod feet over to my desk and read the entire note to the shrieking delight of the class. As punishment for my misdemeanor, I'd have to stand up and read aloud my answer to the last question regarding the elephant story. 4. What do you think will happen to the elephants in the future? Just like some human babies are born with tails or scales, some unfortunate baby elephants are going to be genetic flashbacks and come out albino white and summer's nap black. Then the whole monochrome utopia is going to be all messed up. My first crush was on Stan, the man, Musial, an old first baseman with a corkscrew batting stance who played for the St. Louis Cardinals in the 1940s and 1950s. Eileen Litmus was my second love. She had a vindictive sense of humor, power to left center, and was faster than winter vacation, three qualities I admired in a third grader. Despite our age, Eileen and I were easily the fastest kids in the school. Kids would bet movie money on who would win our Friday marathons around the schoolyard backstops. The ready, get set, go, often caught me flatfoot, staring at her lean figure, my arms frozen in pre-race Tiberian Olympic statue readiness. The sudden whoosh of Eileen's departure would roust me from my trance, her thick dirty blonde hair streaming behind her like jet vapor, denim hip-huggers blurring past the tetherball courts. Pumping my arms and puffing my cheeks like I'd seen the track stars do on TV, I'd try to make up ground just so I could catch a glimpse of her round tan tomboyish face. If the grass near the hopscotch boxes was soggy and she wore the heavier Nike Cortezes, not the lighter Adidas running shoes, I stood a chance of catching her near the handball court, the inner thighs of my corduroys rubbing and buzzing down the stretch. Usually Eileen crossed the finish line first, wading into a welcoming committee of high fives and hugs from the girls. The boys wreathed me with humiliation. Dude, why did you let her win? I lost four great pixie sticks. What the fuck is wrong with you, man? You're supposed to be fast. When's the last time a white sprinter won a race? Would you bowl with a white bowling ball? No, you wouldn't. After a long school day of moralistic bombardment with the aphorisms of Martin Luther King, John F. Kennedy, Cesar Chavez, Pocahontas, and a herd of pacifist pachyderms, my friends and I were ready to think about color on our own terms. We'd make plans to spend the weekend at the beach, sunning in the shoreline's warm chromatics and filling in childhood's abstract impressionism coloring books with our own definitions of color, trying our hardest not to stay inside the lines. Blue. Those without bikes rode on the handlebars. We pedaled side by side in wobbly tandems, yelling our blue profanities, sharing our blue fantasies. We bombarded the windows on the big blue municipal bus with wet baby blue toilet paper grenades. We splashed in the postcard blue of the ocean and stuck out our slurpy blue tongues at the girls two towels over. Eileen's lightsaber blue eyes cut through me like lighthouse beacons lancing the midnight. Sethetolit. When you're young, psychedelic is a primary color and a most mesmerizing high. Santa Monica was full of free multi-hued trips. The colorburst free love murals on Main Street seemed to come to vibrant cartoon life when I passed them. The whales and dolphins frolicked in the clouds and the sea lions and merry-go-round horses turned cartwheels in the street. The spray-any color paint on the spin art creations at the pier were 50-cent Jackson Pollock rainbow heroin hits that made your skin tingle and the grains of sand swell up and rise to the sky like helium balloons. 
looking into the kaleidoscopic eyes of a scruffy Bukowski barfly sitting in the lotus position along the bike trails fractured your soul into hundreds of disconnected psychedelic shards. Each sharp piece of your mind begging for sobriety. White. Santa Monica whiteness was Tennessee Williams's Delta Summer Seersucker suit blinding. The patchy clouds, the salty foams of the cresting waves, my friends, my style, all zinc oxide nose cream white. My language was three foot swells that broke left to right. No way, dude. Tubular biochin, to the max totally fucking rad. White gooner ran teasingly tight circles around the recovering hollowed, out narcanon addicts till they spun like dreidels and dropped dizzily to the ground. White gooner was a broken stringed kite leaning into the sea breeze, expertly maneuvering in the gusty gales. White gooner stabbed beached jellyfish with driftwood spears and let sand crabs send him into a disco frenzy by doing the hustle on his forehead. White was walking to school in the fog. White was ignoring the crossing guards and trying to outrun the morning moon. White was exhaling crystallized plumes of carbon dioxide and knowing it was the frozen exhaust of our excited minds. White wasn't the textbook mixture of radiations from the visible spectrum, it was the opposite. White was the expulsion of colors encumbered by self-awareness and pigment. Black Black was an unwanted dog abandoned in the forest who finds its way home by fording flooded rivers and hitchhiking in the beds of pickup trucks and arrives at its destination only to be taken for a car ride to the desert. Black was hating fried chicken even before I knew I was supposed to like it. Black was being a nigger who didn't know any other niggers. The only black folks whose names I knew were musicians and athletes, Jimi Hendrix, Slash from Guns and Roses, Jackie Joyner Kersey, The Beastie Boys, and Melody the drummer from Josie and the Pussycats. Black was trying to figure out how black Tony Grimes, the local skate pro, was. Tony, a freestyle hero with a signature model Dogtown board, was a hellacious skater and somehow disembodied from blackness, even though he was darker than a lunar eclipse in the Congo. The interviews in Shredder, Rollerblader Sue F.K., and stoked magazines never mentioned his color. Stoked, so, dude? Tony, yeah. Stoked, gnarly frontside Ollie 180 fakey at the Laguna Pro AM. Tony, nailed it, bro, want another hit? Now and then we'd see Tony Grimes, our deracinated hero, in coping and doping skate shop on Ocean Street next to the Tommy Burger. What's up, Tony? we'd all ask coolly, yet with genuine concern in our voices. We'd receive an over-the-shoulder, what's shaken, dude, and fight over who he'd acknowledged. He called me dude. Not you, you Nimrod. Tony Grimes strolled around the shop, a baseball cap magnetically attached at some crazy angle to his unkempt thick clumpy afro. His lean muscular legs loped from clothes rack to clothes rack as he eyed the free shit he would take home after he got through rapping to the manager's girlfriend. Black was a suffocating bully that tied my mind behind my back and shoved me into a walk-in closet. Black was my father on a weekend custody drunken binge, pushing me around as if I were a 12-year-old, 75-pound bell clapper clanging hard against the door, the wall, the shoe tree. Black is a repressed memory of a sandpapery hand rubbing abrasive circles into the small of my back, my face rising and falling in time with a hairy heaving chest. Black is the sound of metal hangers sliding away in fear, my shirt halfway off, hula hooping around my neck. That summer of my molestation, my sister Christina returned from a YMCA day camp field trip in tears. My mother asked what was wrong and between breathless wails Christina replied that on the way home from the Museum of Natural History the campers had cheered, yeah, white camp. Yeah, white camp, and she had felt left out. I tried to console her by explaining the cheer was, yeah, why camp? Yeah, why camp, and no one was trying to leave her out of anything. Expressing unusual concern in our affairs, Mom asked if we would feel better about going to an all-black camp. We gave an insistent, no. 
She asked why and we answered in three parts sibling harmony, because they're different from us. The way mom arched her left eyebrow at us, we knew immediately we were in for a change. Sunday I was hitching a U-Haul trailer to the back of the Volvo, and under cover of darkness we left Halcyon Santa Monica for parts unknown. Ma driving, singing a medley of Temptations hits, my sisters passed out in the back seat, twitching in exhaustion from moving and packing. Ma's voice dropped a couple of octaves as she segued from, my girl, into, Papa was a rolling stone. I rolled down the window, trying to capture the last vestiges of the nighttime salt air, and began writing mental letters to friends I knew I'd never see again. Dear Ryan Fogarty, later, man. Thanks for the ticket to the Henry Rollins slash Anthrax show at the Civic Auditorium and for lending me your slide master trucks and the profane insane urethane wheels, I'll send M back to you. Rock and roll will never die. Dear Stephen Pierce, be cool, gooner. I'll miss the weekend speedboat outings with your red-haired ex, playboy bunny mom and her loaded boyfriend who always wore the stupid skipper from Gilligan's Island hats. I remember how you hated the way he winked at you, one hand on the steering wheel, the other stroking your mother's behind. We did the right thing by pissing in the gas tank, so what if his engine stalled and he nearly died of exposure off the coast of Mexico? I'm sorry, but Larry, not Shemp or Curly or Mo, was the funniest stooge. Susquehanna Hat Company? Dear Eileen, slowly I turn, step by step, Gooner. I never told anyone. I know you didn't. Zoxox, Gooner. Of all my laid-back Santa Monican friends, I miss David Joshua Schoenfeld the most. He was off-white and closest to me in hue and temperament. Strangers would come up to him and ask if he was Mediterranean. David would shake his head, his dollar bill green eyes trying to convey that he was a tan Jewish kid originally from Phoenix and perpetually late for the Hebrew school bus. Every Tuesday and Thursday after bar mitzvah classes we'd meet at the public library and pour through the World War II picture books, doing our best to fight the bewitching allure of fascist cool. Our obsession wasn't a clear-cut Simon Wiesenthal Dudley Do-Right always get your war criminal fixation. We concerned ourselves with whether it would be more fun to fantasize about world domination attired in crushed Gestapo black velvet with red trim or in crumpled green Third Army gum-chewing schleppiness. Himmler is wearing the Aryan Autocrat Summer Ensemble, designed for maximum military foreboding with a hint of patrician civility. Ideal for a morning jaunt through the death camps or planning an autumn assault on the Russian front. By sixth grade we'd read the Junior Warmongers Canon, Main Camp, Boys from Brazil, 30 Saifons over Tokyo, and and Frank, and our allegiances were muddled. On the way to Laker games we'd talk about the atrocities at Buchenwald and Auschwitz. David's father, looking for a parking space, would ask us whether he should feel guilty about playing the serial numbers branded onto his father's forearm in the state lottery. During timeouts we'd test each other on the design specifications and flight capabilities of the Luftwaffe arsenal. The Blitzkrieg clarion the Polish heard whistling out of the clouds in 1939? Please, the Stuka dive bombers. Top speed for the Messerschmitt 109K model. Easy, 452 miles per hour, climb rate 4880 feet per minute. Someone's been studying. Knock this out. Give me the wingspan and ceiling for the Fokker Wolf 190D series. You know that's my favorite plane of all time. Wingspan 33 feet and 5 inches, ceiling 32,800 feet. Don't Fokka with me, man. Chu wanna go to war? Okay, we go to war. Later that night, with permission to sleep over at David's house, we went to war. On our last reconnaissance sortie before bedtime we found a trail of ants on a Bataan death march to underground bunkers beneath his front porch. After five passes with the aerosol deodorant, we applied the matches and watched the soldier ants burn, shouting, Dresden. Dunkirk. Bonsai, 
and strafing their shriveling exoskeletons with plastic scale model airplanes. Then it was inside to watch our favorite video, Tora, 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 stuffing handfuls of Jiffy Pop popcorn in our mouths and cheering for the Japanese. When David's parents were asleep we played Hiroshima Nagasaki in the bedroom. In our astronaut PJs with the crinkly plastic soles we moved the armoire into the hall and cleared enough space for little boy and fat man to land. Fake radio transmissions from the backs of our throats, come in, Los Alamos KKKSSSK. Come in, this is the Enola Gay, do you read? KKKSSSK. Loud and clear, this is Oppenheimer, copy. Oppie baby, is this thing going to work? Oh yeah, equivalent to 20,000 tons of TNT. Do you copy? Roger, 10-4, over and out. We'd simulate the atomic flash by switching the bedroom light on and off as fast as we could, catching strobe glimpses of ourselves as nuclear shadows. Frozen in our positions, we mimicked death, writing letters home, pruning bonsai trees, playing with hot wheels, bent over mid-butt wipe. Before going to bed, we brushed our teeth in the cramped bathroom. I noticed that David put the toothpaste on his brush before passing it under the cold water. I, like most folks, wet my brush, then put on the toothpaste, but I copied him because he was white and I figured maybe I was doing it wrong. The only time race entered our war was when we sat over a basket of French fries drinking root beer and debating who Hitler would kill first, David the diabolical Jew or me the subhuman negroid. It was on our excursions to the library that I stumbled across my first black heroes, the Tuskegee Airmen, the Red Ball Express, some WAC nurses from Chicago, Brigadier General Benjamin O. Davis, Sr., Jesse Owens, and the mess cook who shot down a couple of Japanese zeros from the sinking deck of the Arizona. I kept these discoveries to myself. I didn't think David would find it as juicy as when I told him that Hitler had only half a package. Dear David Schoenfeld, I'm still high from the model airplane glue sniffing session in the alleyway behind Pick and Save. Remember the waterfalls of vomit rushing down our chins and our contest to see who could find the largest chunks of undigested potato chips in their pool of throw-up? Fucking cool. David, somehow through being with you I learned I was black and that being black meant something, though I've never learned exactly what. Baruch Atta Adonai. Shalom, motherfucker, Gunner. I don't remember helping my mother unload the trailer but the next morning I awoke on the floor of a strange house amid boxes and piles of heavy-duty garbage bags jammed with clothes. The Venetian blinds were drawn, and although the sunlight peeked between the slats, the house was dark. My mother let out a yell in that distinct from somewhere in, the kitchen timbre, Gooner, go into my purse and buy some breakfast for everybody. I acknowledged my orders and got dressed. Rummaging through my personal garbage bag, I found my blue Quicksilver shorts, a pair of worn-out dark gray van sneakers, a long-sleeved clay-colored old-school Santa Cruz shirt, and just in case the morning chill was still happening, I wrapped a thick plaid flannel shirt around my skinny waist. I found the front door, and like some lost intergalactic B-movie spaceman who has crash-landed on a mysterious planet and is unsure about the atmospheric content, I opened it slowly, contemplating the possibility of encountering intelligent life. I stepped into a world that was a bustling Italian intersection without Italians. Instead of little sheet metal sedans racing around the Fontana di Trevi, little kids on beat-up big wheels and bigger kids on creaky ten, speeds weaved in and out of the water spray from a sprinkler set in the middle of the street. It seemed there must have been a fire drill at the hair salon because males and females in curlers and shower caps crammed the sidewalks. I ventured forth into my new environs and approached a boy about my age who wore an immaculately pressed sparkling white t-shirt and khakis and was slowly placing one slew-footed black croaker sack shoe in front of the other. I stopped him and asked for directions to the nearest store. He squinted his eyes and leaned back and stifled a laugh. What the fuck did you say? I repeated my request, and the laugh he suppressed came out gently. Damn, cuz. 
You talk proper like a motherfucker. Cuz? Proper like a motherfucker? It wasn't as if I had said, pardon me, old bean, could you perchance direct a new indigene to the nearest corner emporium? My guide's bafflement turned to judgmental indignation at my appearance. Damn, fool, what's up with your loud-ass gear? Nigger got on so many colors, look like a walking paint sampler. Did you find the pot of gold at the end of that rainbow? You not even close to matching. Take your jambalaya wardrobe down to Cadillac Street, make a right, and the store is at the light. I walked to the store, not believing that some guy who ironed the sleeves on his t-shirt and belted his pants somewhere near his testicles had the nerve to insult me over how I dressed. I returned to the house, dropped the bag of groceries on the table, and shouted, Ma, you done fucked up and moved to the hood. Young, dumb, and full of tum.